Hi guys, my name is James. Welcome to my channel and today we'll delve into the story of a murderer known as the Psychopath and the Devil's Disciple, shrouded in mystery and horror. A story that takes us into the depths of a disturbed mind and the chaos of a life marred by cruelty and inexplicable violence from its very beginning. In the 1970s, Britain was a mixed bag of political turmoil, high unemployment and social change, a golden age for culture and an era of gay and female liberation. But beneath the surface of daily life, the United Kingdom witnessed the rise of one of its most enigmatic and terrifying figures that would leave a lasting scar and still chill the spine of the nation. Born into a troubled household, Mackay's early life was anything but ordinary. His father, an abusive alcoholic, set the stage for a childhood riddled with havoc and despair. The streets of Kent, where he spent his early years, were witness to the genesis of what would become one of Britain's most notorious serial killers. But to understand the monster, we must first explore the child. Born at Park Royal Hospital in London in 1952, he grew up in Dartford, Kent, with his parents and sisters. His father Harold was a Scottish accountant, and his mother Marion was of Creole descent from Guyana. Patrick Mackay's life began in an environment of violence and neglect. His father, a towering figure of fear, was a man given to bouts of drunken rage, a rage that often found its target in young Patrick and his mother. The scars of a troubled home are not just physical, but deeply psychological. Mackay's childhood was a tapestry woven with threads of fear, anger, and desperation. Our early experiences shape our future selves. It was in these early years that the seeds of his future self were sown. In Mackay's case, these seeds were planted in a soil of brutality and nurtured a growing propensity for violence and an apparent lack of remorse, characteristics chillingly aligned with psychopathic behavior. His conduct as a child was a prologue to the horrors that would unfold in his adult years. Sometimes Harold told Patrick about his horrifying war experiences. This was father and son's bonding time. Listening to his dad's stories, Patrick got fascinated with battle and death. His father Harold died of a heart attack on his way to work as a result of complications from alcoholism and a weak heart. Mackay was 10 years old. His last words to his son that day were, remember to be good. After his death, Mackay became withdrawn and changed within himself to an extreme extent. He said that albeit his death was a relief to him at the time, it was also a loss of a father who, like a lot of men, have their good sides as well as their bad sides. Later, he took on the role of a father figure in the family and started to beat his mother and sisters in extreme fits of anger. He even attempted to strangle his mom and later one of his aunts. The police were called to their house up to four times per week. Some children start to identify with the abuser rather than the victim, their mother, to prevent themselves, as they think, from being in the same position. Arson, vandalism, and petty theft marked the early chapters of Mackay's life. These acts, disturbing in their own right, were mere precursors to a life that would spiral into the depths of inhumanity. His neighbors say he was very imposing strange-looking, and there was something about his eyes that made them uncomfortable about him. By the age of 10, Mackay's behavior began to mirror the darkness that surrounded him, a darkness that first manifested in acts of fierce cruelty towards animals, a harbinger of the violence that was to come. They were the outlets of a young mind tormented by its own existence, a mind that found solace not in play and laughter, but in destruction and pain. Mackay would struggle in school, bully his younger classmates, torture his pets, and frequently throw temper tantrums. He was later described by a classmate as a little terrorist. As Mackay stepped into his teenage years, the turbulent 1960s were in full swing. But while the world around him was alive with cultural revolution, Mackay was sinking deeper into his own personal hell. In 1968, Mackay made an attempt to murder a 12-year-old boy in the street, strangled him and stole his watch. Later, he claimed that if he hadn't been restrained, he would have succeeded. A teenager now, 
Mackay's life was a carousel of juvenile detention centers and psychiatric hospitals. Each stint, a desperate attempt to correct a course that seemed inevitably set towards disaster. At 15, he was diagnosed as a psychopath by psychiatrist Dr. Leonard Carr, who predicted he would grow up to be a cold, psychopathic killer. At a specialist school, one of his teachers called him a potential murderer of women. In 1968, Mackay was committed to hospital as a psychopath. Many institutions, especially at that time, were treating the symptoms rather than the cause. Mackay's unresolved trauma manifested itself in his anger and hatred towards the world. Hence, his behavior escalated. He was released in 1972 against staff recommendations. After his release, wave of petty crime swept through the affluent London neighborhoods of Chelsea and Knightsbridge. The areas experienced a massive increase in muggings, robberies, and handbag snatchings for which Mackay was responsible. He made friends with elderly women to get into their homes. The streets of London became both his refuge and his hunting ground, a place where he could blend into the crowd, yet stand apart in his isolation and inner turmoil. As he grew older, Mackay became obsessed with Nazi ideology and filled his London apartment with their memorabilia. He picked up on the idea that certain groups of people should be destroyed and said that if he had power, he would kill all the useless old people. His favorite film was The Exorcist. He also frequently used drugs and was a heavy drinker. As the sun set on the 1970s, the true extent of Mackay's descent into darkness began to emerge. The streets of London, alive with the sounds of a city in flux, became the backdrop for a series of shocking crimes. By his early 20s, Mackay was a man marked by his past, a past that transformed a troubled child into a notorious killer. Our story begins in Chelsea, a picturesque district known for its affluence and charm. Here, on a seemingly ordinary day, an unimaginable horror unfolded behind the closed doors of an elderly woman's home. Although Mackay's reign of terror commenced with a series of petty crimes, but it was the murder of Isabella Griffith that marked the beginning of his infamous legacy of terror. In the quiet of her Chelsea home, Griffith's life was brutally snuffed out. Mackay's method was ruthless and calculated, leaving behind a scene that spoke of untold horrors. She became Mackay's first known victim. On 14th of February 1974, 87-year-old widow of a surgeon Isabella Griffith was physically assaulted, repeatedly hit with a heavy blunt object, strangled and stabbed with a kitchen knife in her own home at 19 Cheney Walk, London. She was discovered only after 12 days, when the neighbors started to worry about her milk bottles piling up at her door and called the police. Isabella met Mackay while walking around West End. He offered to carry her shopping bag to her house. She invited him and have a cup of tea. They got on well. He could be a very charming person who quickly gained the trust of elderly ladies. Psychopaths are skilled manipulators. When encountering someone for the first time, it can be challenging to identify psychopathic traits, as individuals with psychopathy often exhibit a superficial charm and can be quite engaging. Isabella needed chores doing. Mackay returned a few times and run errands, went to the shop to buy cat food as Isabella had a number of cats at home. One evening he came to her house, but she didn't let him in and talked to him with a chain on her door. This made him angry and he forced the door open. Mackay said he had a compulsion to kill her and took a knife for cutting meat. He then closed her eyes, crossed her arms across her chest, and covered her with various clothes. After the murder, he took a bottle of scotch out of his pocket and emptied it. Then he turned on the taps in the kitchen sink, threw in her handbag, a towel, some knives, plates, and her shoes. Isabella was not just robbed of her possessions, but of her life, in a manner so cruel it sent ripples of fear throughout the community. Yet. The perpetrator remained a shadow, elusive and unseen. As the investigation unfolded, the police were left grappling with the brutality of the crime. Little did they know, this was just the beginning. The pattern of terror continued. Thirteen months later, the next victim, another elderly woman, 89-year-old Adele Price, suffered a similar fate. 
In her Knightsbridge home, in Lowndes Square, London, Mackay, who had come in asking for a glass of water, struck again with cold-blooded efficiency, leaving behind a trail of clues that slowly began to point towards a serial offender. Adele asked him to wait in the hallway and went to the bathroom to get him some water. He sneaked inside the flat, and when she returned with a glass, she said, Oh, how odd, thinking he had left the flat. She closed the door, turned around, and saw Mackay in her flat. He told her to go to the bedroom. Being tall, with a strength of six men, he strangled her to death. As he described it himself, he had a red mist for a moment. The next thing he remembered was he had her hand round her neck. He didn't remember how or why he did it. Mackay stayed for several hours in Adele's flat, turning on the TV and even falling asleep at some point. Price's granddaughter was on her way home at the time and unknowingly passed the killer as he exited the premises. However, the true extent of Mackay's depravity was yet to be fully uncovered. With two murders casting a dark cloud, the police were under immense pressure. But it was the brutal killing of Father Anthony Crean that brought Mackay's spree into sharp focus. Father Crean, a 63-year-old Catholic priest, was found murdered in his own home. The brutality of the attack was shocking. The body was floating in a bath of water with multiple stab wounds and a horrifying head injury. An axe, a symbol of the savagery, was left at the scene, a gruesome testament to Mackay's escalating violence. The crime scene was horrific even for experienced policemen who had seen a lot of murders before. After the murder, Mackay turned on the taps and was watching the priest die for an hour. There was nothing more lovely than dunking him up and down in that bath, he remarked later. A nun found Crean's body later that night after becoming worried about his whereabouts. Their paths had crossed before, under circumstances that foreshadowed a tragic end. Crean met Mackay in the woodlands near the village of Shorn. Father Crean was a heavy drinker, so they both bonded over their shared passion for alcohol and spent time in a local pub. Mackay and Father Crean's relationship, once marked by a semblance of friendship, had soured. It was a breakdown that set the stage for a sinister crime. On a fateful day in March 1975, Mackay returned to Father Crean's home in Kent, which was near the home of Mackay's mother. Crean said he didn't expect to see Patrick again. Maybe he got scared and panicked. He tried to run out of the house, and that annoyed Mackay. What transpired was a brutal and frenzied attack that extinguished a life dedicated to serving others. The brutality of Father Crean's murder brought a new level of urgency to the police investigation. The net was closing in, but Mackay's reign of terror was far from over. The investigation was now in full swing with Mackay emerging as the prime suspect. The clues left at the crime scenes began to weave a web that led directly to him, and he had been seen in the area by a number of witnesses. In the wake of the brutal murders that shook London, the manhunt for the killer was reaching its critical point. Patrick Mackay whose path of destruction had left a trail of sorrow and fear, was about to face his reckoning. Mackay's fingerprints linked him to the unspeakable acts against Isabella and Adele. His confessions, though initially broad, would eventually retract to just these three murders. The police, armed with forensic evidence and witness statements, were closing in on the man who had eluded them for so long. The breakthrough came when an astute police officer recalled an earlier incident involving Mackay and Father Crean. After Mackay had befriended the priest, he broke into his home and stole a check for 30 pounds. This recollection was the key that unlocked the door to Mackay's dark world. Mackay was found by police in Stockwell in South London two days after the priest's murder. The search of Mackay's residence unearthed a trove of stolen items, linking him to a spate of robberies in the Chelsea and Belgravia areas. The puzzle pieces were falling into place, painting a picture of a man driven by violence and theft. His arrest was a culmination of meticulous police work. But what followed was a descent into the macabre. Mackay's confessions revealed a mind consumed by violence. Mackay, a man whose past was marked by trauma, 
had unleashed his inner demons upon unsuspecting victims. With Mackay's arrest, the streets of London breathed a sigh of relief. In the cold confines of the interrogation room, Mackay recounted his crimes with chilling detachment. His words painted a portrait of a man lost in his own twisted world. In a chilling display of candor, Mackay took detectives to an area in Clapham, where he claimed to have disposed of a knife used in his heinous acts. The Metropolitan Police were now piecing together a pattern of unsolved murders and crimes with Mackay at the center. Initially, Mackay confessed to the murders of Anthony Crean, Isabella Griffiths, and Adele Price. But the depths of his depravity were far greater. In the confines of HMP Brixton, Mackay hinted at more sinister deeds, claiming involvement in several other unsolved murders. Mackay confessed to a series of murders that were as shocking as they were senseless. The victims, seemingly chosen at random, were united only by their tragic encounters with a merciless killer. Among these were Mackay's first murder of 17-year-old German au pair Heidi Mnilk, who he stabbed and threw out of a moving train in South London. The violent end of Mary Hines, beaten to death in her apartment, killed in a very similar way to Isabella and Adele, the tragic killing of a homeless man by pushing him from a bridge into the Thames, the brutal murder by strangulation of 57-year-old Stephanie Britton and stabbing her four-year-old grandson, Christopher Martin, in Hertfordshire, and the death of Frank Goodman battered in his store and murdered with a metal bar over a mere pack of cigarettes. The bar was from the house of Mackay's landlords, who recognized it later. The detectives said it was one of the most horrific crime scenes they had ever seen. The ferocity of it was similar to Father Crean's murder. Later, the police found Goodman's blood under the welt of Mackay's shoes. However, Mackay said he was going to plead not guilty to the murder. Mackay confessed to the murder of 92-year-old Sarah Rodmel in her home in Hackney. He had nailed the back door shut and murdered her by putting her stockings in her mouth. Mackay said, killing her was as easy as washing my socks. 48-year-old cafe owner Ivy Davies in South End was murdered with a heavy object on her head a metal pry bar was found at the scene. She had met Mackay, who said to her that he was a doctor at a mental hospital. The police, delving into Mackay's confessions, found chilling correlations with unsolved cases. The public was reeling from the revelations. The sheer brutality and randomness of the murders left a society filled with fear and disbelief. In the hallowed halls of justice, where the fate of individuals is weighed, Patrick Mackay found himself in the autumn of 1975. The legal system was tasked with unraveling the mind behind the horrifying mayhem. As the trial approached, questions arose about Mackay's mental state. The defense and prosecution clashed over the nature of his psychopathy and its impact on his culpability. Mackay's lawyers argued for diminished responsibility, painting a picture of a man tortured by his own psyche a mind unmoored from the norms of society. Diminished responsibility, a plea that hinges on the defendant's mental capacity to understand the nature of his actions. In Mackay's case, this became the crux of a complex and emotionally charged trial. The trial, a spectacle of legal and psychological drama unfolded before a captivated nation. It was a focal point for a society grappling with the nature of evil. Here was a man who had committed unspeakable acts, and the question now was not just of guilt, but of the very essence of criminal responsibility. As the evidence was laid bare, the courtroom became a window into Mackay's soul. The brutality of his crimes stood in stark contrast to the impassive man who sat in the dock, his fate hanging in the balance as experts and witnesses took the stand, each shedding light on the dark corners of his psyche. Testimonies painted a chilling portrait of a man who had slipped through the cracks of society. A man whose early life of abuse and neglect had blossomed into a full-fledged predation on the vulnerable. Nigel Nelson, who was the crime reporter on the Kent Evening Post at the time, said Mackay showed no emotion. His eyes looked like they belonged to someone else. But the moment they settled on you, they sent a real chill down your spine. The judge, in his summation, 
faced the daunting task of dissecting the myriad layers of Makai's actions and intentions. It was a balancing act between justice for the victims and the consideration of the perpetrator's mental state. Later, Makai denied his confessions apart from the murders of Griffiths, Price, Crean, and the homeless man. There was insufficient evidence to charge him for all of the murders he had confessed to, and police couldn't identify his homeless victim. When the verdict was delivered, it brought a conclusion to a chapter of terror in British history. Mackay was found guilty of manslaughter after pleading guilty on the grounds of diminished responsibility in the deaths of Adele Price, Isabella Griffith, and Father Anthony Crean. The verdict, a blend of relief and disquiet, rippled through the courtroom and beyond. Relief that a killer was behind bars, disquiet at the complexities of human nature it had unveiled. Mackay's defense had pleaded insanity, but the medical experts offered a different diagnosis. Psychopathy, a personality disorder marked by a lack of empathy and remorse, distinct from insanity in the eyes of the law. With the sentencing, Mackay was consigned to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 20 years, a life to be spent behind bars, away from the society he had terrorized. It was a sentence that sought to balance the scales of justice, yet left many pondering the unfathomable depths of the human psyche. The conclusion of the trial brought some closure, but the scars left by Mackay's actions would remain. An abusive father, an environment of constant fear. These were the dark corners where Mackay's psyche began to fracture. But how does a troubled childhood morph into a life of crime? His descent into criminality began early, each act a step further away from societal norms. But it was not just Mackay's actions that were alarming. It was the apparent lack of remorse, a hallmark of psychopathic behavior. Psychopathy, a term often misunderstood, is characterized by a lack of empathy, remorse, and shallow emotions. For Mackay, these traits manifested in a chilling detachment from the suffering of his victims. What goes through the mind of a killer like Mackay at the moment of his crimes? Is it a sense of power, a release of pent-up rage, or a complete disconnection from the reality of his actions? Each victim, a life taken, a story ended. Mackay's ability to interact with his victims, to mask his intentions, demonstrates a chilling level of calculation and control, aspects often associated with psychopathic individuals. The case of Patrick Mackay forces us to confront uncomfortable questions about the nature of evil. Is it born, or is it made? Can the seeds of such darkness be found in the traumas of childhood, or do they lie dormant within, waiting for a catalyst? Mackay's case has been a subject of study for psychologists and criminologists, a case study in the complexities of human behavior. It challenges our understanding of morality, responsibility, and the capacity for change. Over the years, the question of Mackay's release has been a point of contention. Initially sentenced with a minimum term of 20 years, the possibility of his reintegration into society has been a source of concern and debate. In 1995, he became eligible for release. Mackay didn't understand himself what made him commit his horrific murders. He said he was scared of himself and felt terrible about what happened. Did he regret it later? Yes. Was it remorse? No. His main concern was not remorse because of what he had done to his victims. He was rather frustrated because his life was wasted. Today marks a significant milestone in the life of Patrick Mackay. Now 70 years old, he uses the name David Groves. Currently, he resides in an open prison where, despite being denied parole, he's granted the liberty to venture out on license. After spending 48 years behind bars, Mackay is experiencing a taste of freedom once again. On a day release, he was seen navigating through a bustling city center bus station, blending in with the crowd, unrecognizable to the unsuspecting people around him. With a goatee beard, baseball cap, and glasses, he casually interacted with a passerby in Bristol and was even observed standing mere feet away from a baby in a pram. It's important to note that Mackay, diagnosed as a psychopath, lacks a core human trait, empathy. This absence of empathy, a hallmark of psychopathy, 
raises significant concerns about his rehabilitation. Is a person who once confessed to taking 11 lives, although later retracting eight of those confessions, truly capable of change and integration into society? With the devil's disciple back on the streets again, questions rise. Is it worth the gamble? And should those who make these decisions take on some responsibility for the possible consequences? Characterized by a profound lack of remorse, coupled with superficial charm, manipulativeness, and often a high degree of intelligence, psychopaths are known for their inability to form genuine emotional connections, leading them to view others as mere tools to be used for their own gain. This detachment from societal norms and emotional responses can drive a psychopath to commit acts that are incomprehensible to the average person. Gareth Johnson, MP for Dartford in Kent, the area Mackay originally hails from, voices a chilling reminder. There is a real danger from this man. He's still young enough to kill again. As Mackay once said himself, if Satan could come down in human form, he was it. Mackay's next parole hearing is likely to be in 2025, at which point he might potentially be released. Thank you for joining me on True Crime Case Files. To my viewers, your thirst for understanding these complex narratives keeps me driven. Please, share your thoughts in the comments. For more deep dives into the challenging mysteries and captivating true crime stories, subscribe to my channel. In the next episode, I'll uncover another chilling case that awaits its turn in the spotlight. Not to miss it, hit the bell for notifications and be part of the journey through the unexplored paths of true crime. See you next time.